my life, God not only cares, He answers your real problems. I'm talking about sometimes financial problems. God answers those problems. I'm talking about internal problems. God answers those problems. Problems with a spouse, problems with a job, problems with children, problems with a truck. God answers real world problems. Some of you have seen that before, haven't you? You've seen God work in miraculous and supernatural ways. Isn't God good? He still comes to me. He still comes to you. We're at the end of the story now, chapter 8, 9, and 10. By now, Esther has gone through the second feast. She's now relayed to the king what the problem is. It's that wicked man Haman. We talked about that last week. And now the story has taken a wonderful turn. Can I just say, on a side note, I like happy endings. You ever read a book, maybe watched a movie where it's a sad ending, it's terrible? My wife has a knack for choosing those. It'll be just a great thing. And boy, just the, 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 the good person just goes off and whatever happens. And I'm like, honey, again, how do you do this? How do you know? And she's like, oh my goodness, how did I pick it? I, I, we did, typically do not like sad endings. We like happy endings. Sometimes with a sad ending, we get to the end and we feel like strangely empty. That's not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be, and they lived happily ever after. Rode off into the sunset. Now, if you read the end of the Bible, you know what the end of the story is? And they lived happily ever after. Because they're with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ and God. But, but not only is it the end, along the way, there are happy endings. Here is one of those things. And what happens at the end of the story is that we know that Haman is defeated... All right, Haman the villain gets what's coming to him and the Lord causes the good people, the good guys to prosper. I'm glad that I'm on the winning side. I'm going to say that one more time. I'm glad that I am on the winning side. Oh, we have forces that are against us as Christians. Reading this morning in the book of Daniel. We'll reference Daniel later on. But Daniel, the angel that was sent to Daniel, was hindered by the prince of Persia. The prince of Persia. Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. And the, the messenger from God was hindered by the prince of Persia, a, a demonic being. Don't, don't even mistake the fact that we are still, there are still forces that are fighting against us as Christians. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. There are forces out there, but I'm glad that I have God, the creator of the universe... His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, which lives inside of me as a Christian, and I'm on their side, which is the winning side. Daniel, referencing Persia, of course, was just a little bit older than this story. Just a few years, we looked at that first week. But at the end of the story, we come, there's some stark contrasts at the end of the story. Where fear once was, confidence is now seen. Where sadness once reigned, joy could be heard. Where non-believers once stood, now believers stood in their place. Where once was failure and defeat, now stood victory and accomplishment. And once where there was no story, now stood a story for the ages. I'm glad that the Lord brought a tremendous victory. I want this morning, if I can, to encourage you. Sometimes when you're preaching... There's a message of repentance, and we need those messages, do we not? I need them. You can say, honey, don't say amen so loud. Sometimes there's messages of compassion. I'm thankful for those. This one, if I had to categorize it, would be encouragement and hope. Some lessons that we can learn, I believe, the ways that God still works in your life and in my life today. Three ways that God worked in Esther chapter 8 that I believe he still works today. That's the Lord's help and blessing, then we'll jump into Esther chapter 8 this morning. Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, thank you for caring for us. And that while we were yet sinners, Lord, you came and you died on the cross. But Lord, thank you also that after we're your children, you still take care of us. Lord, you don't just leave us in our own ways, you watch over us. And Lord, sometimes my life and the lives of some of these people, Lord, the way seems dark. Lord, we're looking for you to work. Lord, would you encourage our hearts this morning? Would you show us some things from this passage that will point us back to you? In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. God still works. God still loves his children. 
God still loves to show himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. You say, oh, pastor, there's the catch. I knew it. I knew it. If I'm perfect, then God will help me. Well, I'm sure glad that's not the criteria. If that was the criteria, all of us are sunk. All of us are in a whole world of hurt. But God still loves to work, and He loves to work today, and He loves to work tomorrow, and He loves to work next week. God still loves to work. I want to notice in this passage three ways, and three ways that God can change something. First of all, it's found in verse numbers 1 and 2 of Esther chapter 8. Would you look there? Esther 8, verse number 1, the Bible says, on that day. Now that day, if we go back to chapter 7, was the day of the feast. The day that Esther came forward and said, listen, I'll finally tell you my request, king. It's the fact that there's an enemy, his name's Haman, and Haman ended up being hung on the gallows that he had built for Mordecai. On that day, King Ahasuerus did not waste any time. He got down to business, he began to work. On that day, the Bible says, did the king Ahasuerus give the house of Haman the Jews' enemy unto Esther the queen. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was unto her. And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it unto Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. In two short verses, we have a complete reversal. Uh, it, it's almost like we have this whole build up, all right, and now the book is done as quick as you can snap your fingers, it seems like. In two short verses, here it is God has changed the situation. God, and it, it, don't miss this, God can change your situation. How fast? Just like that. Just like that, God can change it. What did God do? I just uh, would like you to notice that God often has a sense of humor. Some irony in there. When Haman, uh, when Haman was going against the Jews and Mordecai challenged Esther to go back and, and, to, and to, to try to get some relief and some salvation for the Jewish people from the king, I don't think that Mordecai at all had in his mind that he would be in charge of Haman's household. That wasn't his request. Yet our Lord often works in strange and mysterious and ironic ways. Oh, this is what you trust. We see this throughout the Bible. You'll remember there's a, a time in the Bible where uh, some enemies of God captured the Ark of the Covenant. Ark of the Covenant was a, a picture of God's presence. And so they parked the Ark of the Covenant in front of a false god. His name was Dagon. It was a false idol. And they were basically saying, oh, our God, Dagon, is bigger than your God, Jehovah. The next morning, they got up. When they came out to their temple to worship their God, their God was on the ground, prostrate on his face before the Ark of the Covenant. The Lord has a sense of humor. I wonder how he knocked the idol down. Did he? Gabriel. Watch that. Did he just blow? Boom. Well, that was a problem in, 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 their, in their life. It's always a problem when your God's fallen down. All right, some trust in horses and chariots. We'll trust in Jehovah. We'll trust in the Lord. You'll find out what's your God and when it affects your heart. All right, and their idol was flat on the ground. Uh-oh, this can't be. Uh, we've conquered the other God. So they had to pick up their idol. Oh, great God. Oh, we'll pick you back up. It's never a good thing when you have to pick up your own God. It, never a good thing. The Lord has a sense of humor. And again, they, again, they rejoiced, oh, we, we conquered the, the Jehovah. They came out the next morning, and God, with a sense of humor, Dagon, the God, was fallen prostrate again in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And this time, he lost his head and his hands. There was no repairing that false God. They didn't have Gorilla Glue back then. The Lord has some irony. And we see it here where God changes Mordecai's situation, Esther's situation, just like that. Where before, though I uh, had no doubt that he had some uh, prosperity, he had some wealth to be able to sit in the gate of the king, now he was in charge of Haman's entire estate. 
Remember that after the first banquet, Haman saw Mordecai and he was so distraught, he went home and made his wife and counselor sit down. And remember, he told them about his great children, his great family, and his great riches. And now Mordecai has him. Now he's in control. Just like that, his situation was changed. Just like that, Mordecai didn't have an ear of the king before. Now, the very ring that Haman had put and stamped into the document that would cause destruction to the Jews, now that very same ring Mordecai was holding. God can change your situation just like that. You say, well, pastor, that's a, a great thing. Does God ever do that? Of course He does. Of course He does. Throughout the Bible we see that. Did you remember the storm and the disciples? Jesus stood up and He said, Peace be still. Change of situation. Right? Just like that. God works. We see Daniel and Darius in the lion's den. God changes earthly situations. We see the disciples that he called from fishermen to now disciples of God, tax collectors, now disciples. God wants to change. He's able to change your earthly situation. But don't miss this. God always wants to change your spiritual situation. He always wants to change that situation. Those who were lost now can be found. Those who, who were blind now can see. Those who had no hope now have hope. Because of Jesus Christ, God can change your situation. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The very best thing that ever can ever happen to you is for you to put your trust in Jesus Christ. There is nothing, nothing better than trusting Jesus Christ, being lost and now found, being on your way to a devil's hell to spend eternity apart from Jesus Christ and from God. Now, because of trust and faith in Jesus Christ, I can now spend an eternity with God and with Jesus forever and ever and ever. There is nothing better than a change in your spiritual situation. And if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, my friend, would you trust Him today? Oh, it's easy. Jesus compared it once to drinking water, to eating bread. It's an easy, it's an easy decision. Faith in Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And my friend, if you have trusted Christ, I hope you never forget the day that Jesus changed your spiritual situation. It ought to put a smile on your face and a spring in your step because I'm on my way to heaven. Sometimes the way gets dark, doesn't it? Come on, am I the only one? Looking at me like I'm some pagan up here. That's all right. I'm not perfect. That's for sure. Like, oh, pastor, no, not in my life. It's not. Just your life it must be. Sometimes things don't go out like I planned they would. And I got a good plan in my mind. I always have a good plan. I know where I'm going, right? Till I'm lost. I know how it's going to go together. Till it doesn't. Right? I know exactly how to handle that problem. Till I don't. And God can still change your situation. Think about this though. Book of Esther, we've gone through seven chapters. Definitely amount of time in here. A few months. We see that later on when they send the messengers and how long it takes to send messengers across the country. Up until this point, what do you think they were feeling? What was me? Day of mourning, sadness, dejection. And yet, just like that, on that same day, boom, God changed the situation. He can do it again. Let's keep on moving on this passage. I want you to see something else though. God not only can change your situation, God can change your fears. Look with me in verse number 3. And Esther spake yet again before the king, and fell down at his feet, and besought him with tears to put away the mistress of, of Haman, the Agagite, and his device that he had devised against the Jews. 
Verse 4, Then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadaphan, the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which are in all the king's provinces. Now don't miss this. Don't miss this. Verses 3 through 5, Esther goes back to the king. She goes in there and he extends the golden scepter. We'll see she does this one more time. I believe it's chapter 9. You see, well, great. That's right. I see it, Pastor. She, he goes in there. She gives a request. Don't miss the fact that just a couple chapters earlier, she had not been called before the king for a 30 days. And Mordecai had said, Esther, you need to go before the king. She said, I can't. I've not been called. And everyone knows that if you've not been called and he doesn't extend the scepter, you'll die. She was afraid. She was afraid. End of that passage we looked at in chapter 4. She says, I'll go. You fast and, and pray. And if I perish, I perish. She obeys by faith and overcomes her fears. And I came to this passage in chapter 8, and I see that Esther goes back before the king. But I looked very hard and I studied very diligently. I couldn't see anywhere where she asked people to pray for and fast for her again. Do you? I didn't see where she spent three days preparing to go see the king. Do you? What I see is, she goes, I gotta go back to the king. And she goes right there. The thing that she did fear she now walks in by faith. The thing that did, cause, that did cause her consternation now it doesn't even bother her. She runs right before the king. You see, when you trust in God, he can reveal the true situation. Usually what causes us to cower in fear is just fear itself. Just fear itself. She thought bad and saw good. She thought death and sought deliverance. She thought passivity and she saw action. You see, what we think isn't always reality. And, and don't miss this. When you act upon faith, it becomes easier to act upon faith. But when you take the step of faith, it becomes easier to take another step of faith and see God work again and again and again. You see, sometimes our problem is, sometimes my problem, sometimes your problem is that first step. To follow in faith. Whether it be with financial, whether it be with a life decision, faith. You realize, she realized that God's way is the best way, that God does take care of his own. He'll provide all his needs, all her needs. It was a man. Make a little plainer for you. And he sought some uh, psychiatric help. He explained to the counselor that whenever he lay in bed, he would be afraid that something under the bed would harm him. I have children. Many of you do as well. Maybe you've faced this scenario before. Closet, things outside. This man, his problem as an adult was under the bed. <clears throat> he would crawl under the bed, as the story goes, look thoroughly, and after seeing nothing, would then be hit with the idea that something was on top of the bed that would harm him and then be stuck under the bed the rest of the night. The psychiatrist was so helpful, he said that he could help the man, but it would take a few sessions, and each session would cost $150. We're in the wrong line of work, apparently. After a few weeks, though, the psychiatrist called the man to, to say, Hey, I haven't seen you. Can I still help you? We need to start your sessions. And the man said, No. My problem is solved. I solved it with a buddy at work for 10 bucks. Psychiatrist apparently was now intrigued. He said, well, what happened? He said, well, I called my buddy, told him the problem, and for 10 bucks he came and cut the legs off my bed. You know what God does in your life and my life? He cuts the legs off the bed. The things that we thought we were afraid of weren't really a thing, and God cuts them off so we don't have to live in fear. Steve Evans taught in Sunday school this morning, a great lesson in Sunday school, but he made a statement that I knew would, when he hit it, said it would be worth mentioning in church. He mentioned that there, uh, he had read an article about Ann Landers. Ann Landers used to answer um, letters. 
And I guess she would get like 10,000 letters a month. And someone asked Ann Landers what the overwhelming problem was, overwhelming theme of problems in the letters. And this is what he said, that she said that the overwhelming problem that she saw over and over again was fear. Fear. God hath not given us a spirit of fear. You see, what you're afraid of may not be what I'm afraid of. And it's easy for me to make fun of what you're afraid of, but what I'm facing is real. What I'm facing, no, that that fear is real. My shadow is a lot more deadly than your shadow. My bed has a lot bigger legs on it than your bed. And God can defeat your fear. God can change your fears. And here I see where Esther, and I didn't want to miss this point, Esther, who was afraid, Esther, who had to pray and and fast for three days and ask Mordecai and the Jews in Shushan, the capital there, to do the same thing. She wouldn't go, but now, now, it's like she just runs in there. It's now, it's like she walks in and she owns the place. Going back to the king, okay, great to see you, golden scepter. Okay, let me tell you what I need now. Well, let me tell you what I need. And men, those who are married, we understand that. Let me tell you what I need. She had confidence. And my friend, can I encourage you? You can have confidence as well. Not because we're good people, not because there's anything inside of us that is good, but because God loved us. He sent his son Jesus to die for us. He gave us a Holy Spirit. And now what caused us to be afraid can be conquered by faith in God. We can go boldly to his throne not cower, ask and make our requests known. We're able to face those things, and God defeats those things. My kids know this saying in our house, don't let fear control you. I've seen many people let fear control them. I'm talking now to adults. Pastor, I know what God wants. I just can't do it. Not because, not because they're trying to be rebellious, not because they're trying to be stubborn, but because fear paralyzes and immobilizes. But when we walk in fear, when we walk in fear and we don't obey God, understand that the result is the same. If God has asked me to do something and I say, no, I'm not going to, in flat out rebellion, that's terrible. But if I don't do it, Because I'm afraid, I still have not obeyed God. And God can change your fears. Oh, having those little children around the house, sometimes my kids get afraid of things. They're afraid of strange things like, now the four-wheeler catching on fire. After my lawnmower caught on fire. Strange things these kids are afraid of. I don't know if I mentioned this in church, but after that incident, my son called me. He said, Dad, I think the four-wheeler was leaking gas everywhere. I said, Johnny, that's impossible. It's not leaking gas everywhere. He goes, oh, yeah, loud boom, hiss, and there it goes everywhere. I said, don't worry, son. All right, Dad's here. And we got it fixed. It was just antifreeze, just antifreeze. But after that one, kids can be afraid. Sometimes we see something that happened to somebody else. We're like, oh, I know what that is. I know what that is. I know what's happening there. And we're wrong. God can change your fears. And my friend this morning, let me encourage you. I don't know what may be hindering your walk with God, what may be a fear in your life. God, through his power and through your faith, can defeat those fears. Put his arm around us. The Bible says, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Let God cut the legs off your bed. Last one is this. Look at verse 15 if you would. He changes the situation. He changes the fears. That's verse 15 in Mordecai. He went out, verse 15, from the presence of the king in royal apparel, of blue and white and with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. Wow, he's dressed to the nines, isn't he? He's looking good, isn't he? He's got purple and linen and a gold crown on his head. Man, and the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. If you remember a few chapters back, after the command from Haman, the city was perplexed. The city was confused. 
People were scratching their heads saying, what is going on? You ever feel that way? Welcome to 2020. What is going on? And here the Bible says the city was glad. Verse 16, the Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, with us wherever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. God can change your situation. God can change your fears. And God can change your attitude. God can change your attitude. Look what happens here. God brought joy where there was grief. Now there's gladness. Joy and gladness came when they realized salvation had come. Joy and gladness when they found out that forever it was a different situation. Or I'll say it this way. God can turn your bad days into good days. You ever have a bad day? Come on. You ever have a bad day? We could have a bad day competition. And some of you would love that competition. Let me tell you about my bad day. Oh, man, it can top your bad day. They're like fishing stories, aren't they? They're like hunting stories, not accounts, stories. Man, there was a big bug. How many? Oh, oh, huge, huge antler spread. You know, a hundred points to that, to, to that buck. Yeah. And boy, if I'd been any closer, I would have got it. How far were you? Oh, about four miles away. Boy, I just missed him just like this. Boy, just right across his back. It was a shot of the century. What'd you shoot with? Oh, I had, uh, I had a slingshot, actually. And uh, fishing stories, right? Man, my rod was bent over in half. How big? Oh, about a thousand pound walleye for sure. Th those don't exist. Oh, yeah, I have one on my, on my rod and reel for sure, right? Come on. Bad day's the same way. Let me tell you about my bad day. Oh, man, oh, man, my bad day. It's like a hunting and fishing story. But God can turn your bad days into good days. Just like that. There are all these bad days. Bad day, sorrow, mourning, fasting, prayer, depression, sadness. And just like that, a bad day into a good day. Not only that, God brings fulfillment. You notice in that verse 17, they had a feast. There was fasting, now they're feasting. They weren't eating, now they're gorging themselves. God brings fulfillment from empty to full. And God brings influence. Verse 17 is an interesting verse, the end of it, it says, And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. There's some thought about what that means if they were afraid of the Jews, but I don't necessarily buy that interpretation. That The passage doesn't lend itself to that, because um, in the passage, more so the Jews are able to defend themselves, not go out and hunt people. Haman's, Haman's decree was to hunt the Jews. The Jews can now defend themselves. And so I don't know if it was the fear of that. The other interpretation, which I would buy into more and, and think it's closer, is that they saw the Jews and the fear of God that the Jews had fell upon them. That same fear. They became Jews. I'm not here to question their motives. I'm here to say this, that before it wasn't popular to be a Jew, but now it was. Before, no one wanted to be a Jew, but now everyone, it seemed like, wanted to be a Jew. Thing is, you never know who's watching. You never know, Christian. You never know, friend, how quick God can change a situation and how your testimony can influence others. I can't help but think that during this time, the COVID-19... It wouldn't make sense that God's church would grow. Right? It makes sense that, that it would diminish. That God's word would, would diminish. Yet we have seen the exact opposite. I'm not talking just about here at First Baptist Church, though we've seen it here. I'm talking about across the country. We've seen people turn to Jesus Christ. We've seen the influence of the Bible reach people that have never been reached before. You never know when God wants to turn that just like that. You say, well, pastor... That's real nice. God can change a situation, fears, and attitude, but does he really want to do that for me? 
Can I remind you of a few verses? Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Let me give you the key. Let me give you kind of the key that unlocks what's going on here. Hey, there are two elements to look at the book of Esther. One, seek God's face. In the very first pronouncement, Mordecai sought God's face. Christian, sometimes the reason, and often I should say, I would say it this way, the reason that we don't see God work is we've not asked him to get involved. We've gone our own path. We've figured out our own ways to solve it. We've worried enough for him and everyone else in the world, but we've not sought God's face. Say, God, I got nothing. Lord, I need you. Is God's face your first priority? Second key is this. Stay faithful to him. Stay faithful. Lamentation says this, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Psalm 46.10 says this, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Minister once was talking to an evangelist. And the minister, the preacher, was holding services in the church, but he said this to the evangelist. He said, I have no faith in this matter, but I see it in the Word of God, so I'm going to act on the Word of God, no matter how I feel. And the evangelist wisely said, my friend, that is faith, seeing and doing, seeing and believing. And even if you don't see the end result, you see it in God's Word, and so you obey. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. My friend, this morning, can I encourage you? I don't know in what part of the story in your life you're in. You may be at the part where the Haman has just come down. The Bible says in Galatians, and be not weary in well-doing. Be not weary in well-doing. Don't get tired in well-doing. Keep on seeking God's faith. Keep on being faithful. And be not weary in well-doing for in due season. Oh, I can't wait till due season. And it says for in due season. It does not say, well, if you get lucky, this may happen. If you happen to call heads and the Lord flips a coin, it's heads, and, and hopefully it's not tails. Or if maybe they spin the dial and your number comes up, or if you get bingo. It doesn't say maybe. It says for in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. Does God still do those things? You better believe it. You better believe it, my friend. You can bank on it. But be not weary in well-doing. Maybe this morning you're weary. You know what? Take the next step. Don't quit today. For in due season, you shall reap. You will. We will. I will. You will. If we faint not. Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, I'm so glad that we can see you work in our life. And Lord, I don't know all the stories this morning. But Lord, I imagine someone's here who may need to see you work. Lord, I pray that this morning you would encourage our hearts to believe that you are who you say you are. You will do what you say you will do. Lord, help us not to grow weary in well-doing. I want to be here this morning, my friend, and you say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. Would you pray for me? Because there's been times I thought about throwing the towel. It's tough. Pastor, I know what you're saying is right, but right now I don't. Maybe I don't feel it. I don't see it. Would you pray for me that I would not be weary in well-doing? That I'd keep on? That I'd begin to pray and seek God's face? But would you pray for me that I'd stay faithful in what God has called me to do? I would say this morning, Pastor, would you pray for me when you pray?
that I'll be there, that I'll stay faithful. Who is that? Just slip your hands back down. We'll see it. Amen. Who else? Amen. Amen. Who else? Pastor, pray for me. Lord, touch my heart this morning. I needed that. Who else? Amen. Who else? Amen. Amen. I wonder if you're here this morning or online. You've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you die today, you don't know you go to heaven. You say, Pastor, I'm not sure that I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up, slip back down, and I'll mention you in prayer with the others. Anyone here? Lord, guide this time. Lord, those who raised a hand, would they bend a knee? Lord, would you encourage their hearts? Well, I don't know all those who are even online, but maybe there's someone there who's heart has been discouraged Lord who looks at all the situation that they're in and feels defeat and Lord you can change that in a moment Lord help us to walk by faith even when our sight tells us otherwise Lord help those who have raised a hand and there's someone here who's not saved Lord would you help them to come today and trust you as your savior Lord guide this invitation your name, amen. As we stand to our feet, the piano's already playing. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. If God touched your heart, you move this morning. The altar's open. We have someone pray for you. If you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, we'd love to have someone open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure. situation. He can defeat your fears and crush your attitude. He can do something and he wants to do something in your life. He's working in the lives of so many. He wants to work in your life. And if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, we'd love to open the Bible. If you're online today and never trusted Christ, my friend, would you, would you give us a phone call? There'll be a number on the screen. We'd love to open the Bible over the phone and tell you how you can know for sure you can go to heaven. The best news we know that God loves you and Jesus died for you. It's no secret what God can do. with us sing that chorus it is no secret what God can do it is no secret among us. Lord, thank you for working in my heart. Lord, thank you that what you've done for others, you can do for me. And Lord, I pray there's someone here who's never trusted you. They would today. Lord, if there's a Christian here who's um, looking to see your work, that you would work in a mighty and a magnificent way. Lord, may we keep our eyes focused on you, the author and finisher of our faith. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen.